right, now stand with me for a second. Did, did you bring your Bible? Okay, if you brought your Bible, kind of open it up, and now you, neighbors, look at your neighbor's Bible a second, all right? Look and see if it looks used. All right, so look at your neighbor's Bible a second. Look and see if it looks used. This the Bible is a study book. You can underline things. You can star things. You can put dates and so forth like that. Uh, now turn to your neighbor and say, you should use it a little bit more. <laughs> should use it a little bit more. This is a life-giving book, all right? This, this, is, uh, this is the Word of God when we believe it, amen? All right, so say it with me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I just want to talk a little bit more again today about the fact that love flourishes within us. It's supposed to flourish, amen? The heart of God is supposed to flourish in us. We were bought through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We owe our life to him. We also owe the fact to live our life according to his word, not according to our opinions or our thoughts or what we think, but according to the word of God. Now, John 15 uh, the scriptures that are familiar, but it says, a branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away, trims it off, takes it away, he cleanses, repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. Now I want you to it repeatedly prunes. It's a constant thing in our life. Pruning is one of those things, let's call it this, let's say correction, all right? He corrects us, all right? Uh, uh, and he doesn't correct us through bad things, he corrects us through his word. He is a good shepherd. He is a good God. He is the true vine. And, and he brings life to us. So God isn't correcting us. He's not giving you something bad, an accident or something awful. I was, oh, what's God saying to me? No, God is saying here. <laughs> and whenever we say, what is God saying? Well, that should just cause us to sit down uh, and read more. Amen. And to look at what Jesus, what, the, what his word says. So he cleanses repeatedly, prunes every branch so it continues to bear, and it wants to bear more fruit. Say more. More fruit. More, more fruit all the time. Excellent fruit. You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you, teachings I've discussed with you. So this word, the Bible, is constantly pruning us. So every, everybody, every, all the time. So when I'm in the Bible on a daily basis, He's snipping, snipping stuff and so forth in my life because he wants me to do better. He wants me to live for him. He wants to adjust my attitudes and so forth like that. I think we have it also in the new living and so forth, the same thing. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit. You've already been pruned, purified. So he's provided for this. He's provided. It's already given to us to be pruned and purified through the message, the word of God that he gives to us. Amen. You know, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. So a person, we get saved, all right, so our sins are forgiven. He loves us, loves the world, but he doesn't want to leave us there. Turn to your neighbor and say he wants to change you. He's always in that place. The Holy Spirit is, a, is an agent of change, so he's always bringing change into our life in a good way. I, I'm talking about change, godly change. Now, in Romans 5.1, it says, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. I love this verse. I mean, this is a staple in, in Christianity and so forth. And, of course, the Billy Graham Association always had this and, and crusades and so forth. So we have peace through Jesus Christ. But then look at, look at the next verse, verse 8. Verse 8 says, God demonstrated his love toward us. While we were, yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he demonstrated, first of all, he demonstrated his love toward you and I. While we were lost, while we were sinners, and he gave us this wonderful embrace of love, which is amazing, amen? So while we were still sinners, all right, life's not, not good, all right, Christ died for us. He demonstrated love. Love is, love is an action word. The fruit of the Spirit are always action things, something you do. Verse 10, then, it says this, that, he, that uh, uh, while we were enemies... 
So one was sinners. Now I go two verses later, it says, while we were enemies, he reconciled us to God through the death of his son and, and were saved by his life. So, so now while we were enemies, he gave his life for us. So we were lost sinners, but also turned around, we were his enemies. Now, now think of it this way. Think how God then loves everybody. Amen. Something we talk about here. So he loves everybody on the planet. Everybody. From every religion, from every sin that you could think of. As bad as you could think it, he loves them. Right? So he loves the sinners. He loves his enemies the same. While we were enemies, we don't think about it like, oh, well, I don't know if I was that bad. No, sin is sin. And so if you're contrary to the things of God, that's an enemy. We all were enemies of the cross of Christ that we now have embraced and we become his friends. But we must remember that he still loves his enemies who are other people maybe, right? So we, st we have to remember that. Ephesians 1, or Ephesians, yeah, 1, verse 5 and 6 says that even while we were his enemies, he planned for us to be adopted. So this, don't, people get all messed up over this word. It just means he had planned. God planned to save the world. Amen? He loves everybody in the world, so he's not planning for anybody to go to hell. All right? He doesn't do that. He plans for them to get saved. He wants people to get saved. doesn't mean they all will because people have a choice. But his plan, he wants people to come to heaven. He made a place in heaven for people. He wants them there. Incidentally, the kingdom is expanding all the time in a good way. People are getting saved in droves around the world. Amen. So, so uh, hard times... They're, they're, you know, we're coming to the last days and times get harder and harder, especially as you look around the world. But I tell you, that'll cover the whole world eventually, including the United States. So there will be tremendous revival where people, all of a sudden you lose everything else you're trusting in, and then it's him. And the seeds that you've planted in people then at that point might grow because the Holy Spirit reminded them, you need Jesus. Amen. That's why we share Christ with people. That's why we tell people about Jesus. Because at the time, it may look like they're rejecting. I looked at one point like I was rejecting it. Well, I was rejecting. It just didn't look like it. I was rejecting. But, but, hallelujah, at some point, the Holy Spirit brought that back to me. In a bar, actually. And I get saved in a nightclub. God is working by His Spirit. So, so He planned that we would get adopted to Himself according to His good pleasure. As a parent, you don't accidentally adopt a child. You plan to adopt a child, right? You plan, you make a per, on purpose, you're saying, I, I want this child. And the child, it's not like, well, I want this child, let's see, if they're going to grow up and have good grades, if they're going to be a model citizen, if they're this, or that. no, you just plan to adopt that child. And they become a part of your life and they take your name. A part of your inheritance, that child. So it's a pleasure. God had pleasure. Oh, I love this world. I love people. Still sinners, still enemies, but I love them. Amen. The whole world was contrary to Jesus Christ prior to the cross. Even his own, the Jews did not receive him, did not recognize him, did not follow him, did not want him. <laughs> but he wanted them. Amen. You know, God never, he does not hold offense. He doesn't get bitter. He doesn't, he doesn't get upset like, all right, I'm never forgiven you. He doesn't do that. His nature, his character, everything about him is love to people. It's all this way, all this way to us. And if we return it, you know, we love him because he first loved us. Oh, he loves that because we're called into the fellowship of his dear son, Jesus Christ. But if we don't return it, then it's up to us. Someone doesn't accidentally end up in hell. They go to hell because they choose hell. That's what happens. It's not like, oh, he would never do that. He wouldn't send them there. No, they sent themselves there. God's plan is to send everybody to heaven. But many people choose. No, I don't want God. I don't want Jesus. And they're choosing hell. It's amazing how people get so spiritual at a funeral. Amazing how people want to give me advice at a funeral. You know, well, you know, reverend, God is merciful and so forth. They made their choice. They made their choice. I just had a funeral, you know, for a person overdose on drugs. People make choices. You want to live, live like the world, live like hell, live like the devil, and they die. It isn't like, oh, I feel sorry for you. I'll let you go to heaven. No, they rejected all the time. 
Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. So God doesn't send someone to hell. They send themselves there. You know, someone dies, they prepare for the Lord. The Lord could say, well, let's say reject, 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 reject. Sorry. Remember, even the rich man who said, Lord, Lord, you know, okay, I deserve this, but send someone to, send, send Lazarus back to tell my brother and my families. You know what God said? He said, they have the word. They have the word. If they're going to reject that, they will, they'll, even if he comes back, they're still going to reject. Amen? Pretty amazing. So, so then he goes to the praise and glory of his grace, which he made us accepted in the beloved. So I love the fact God made us acceptable. So you have to receive his love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Who hasn't made mistakes? All have sinned, right? All have sinned, fallen short. So, so we have to also now, when we receive Christ, receive acceptance that he loves us. It's not, like, it's not like he's got black sheep in the family that, oh, these, these sheep are, they're, my, they're sheep, but we don't really like them that much because, no, no, he, he loves everybody. Accepted. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're accepted. You have to accept, you have to accept this love. It's unconditional. There's no, in other words, no conditions are required. Well, you mean I'm a son and a daughter? I just, it's, I just get all these promises. Yep, yep. But I've never been that good. Doesn't matter. Amen. <laughs> I'm not a perfect person. Doesn't matter. I've given all these promises to you. You got the whole playbook. Go for it. You can have it all. It's not a question. It's not even a question on prayers answered about how good you are. It's about how good he is. And he always responds to faith. Now, it's impossible to please him without faith. Right? It's not improbable. It's impossible. So... So no matter the lifestyle we've had before, and if you look in the Bible, you see people that were gay, effeminate, transgenders, all those things that are actually in the scripture, and this actually says at one point in Corinthians, such were some of you. Yeah. All of a sudden, now they got a whole, all the promises. Amen. 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 They, are, they are, uh, belong in Christ and they're Abraham's seed, and all the promises come to them just like you and I. Amen. God is good. He's just lavishly good to people. Of course, it's up to us to accept that, but he's good. No conditions required other than faith. Now, Luke chapter 6, we talked about then. So you see then, if he loves the sinner, loves out people, enemies, we were enemies and so forth, then you see why Jesus is talking about these things in Luke <clears throat> that we call the Sermon on the Mount. He's just outside talking to people, but he's just saying, love your enemies and so forth, do good and land your reward will be great. Sons of the Most High. This is what he's looking for in his character. Character. <laughs> I, I just have to say again, character comes before giftings. Because you can have great giftings. You can have a beautiful house. But I tell you what, if the foundation is flawed and cracked, the house is going to crumble. Just not, not going to be good. So you have to have the good foundation. That's character. He wants us to be like him, the Most High. And he's kind, again, to the unthankful and to the evil. He's kind to the sinner. He's kind to his enemies. He's just that way. And there's no buts. There's no ifs. There's no other things. It's he's commended his love toward the world, toward us. And I'm so glad he did, because that's why I'm standing here today. Because <laughs> he commended his love toward us. Amen? Because... Because he cares for us. So this love is generous. Amen? It's generous. Now, you go to the next verse there, in verse 38 then. This is the verse then, not about money. Although most of the time, this verse is used in offerings. Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. So people are up giving an offerings. Well, you want to give because it'll be given to you and so forth. And like the Holy Ghost slot machine. Come on, come on, let's go. Given it shall be given. Has nothing to do with money. Has nothing to do with an offering. Has everything to do with love. That's the context. Can you see that? Always we want to take scripture and we want to put things in a context. Where was it said? How was it said? In what way was it said? So he says all these things and now he says, I want you to give love. I want you to give good things to others. I want you to bless people and it shall be given to you. 
Amen? So we have this lavish, this lavish thing of the context of love, of giving love, this generous. Nothing, nothing demonstrates love more than you or I loving somebody else Amen. who's maybe not lovable, who doesn't seem lovable, but willing to give ourselves so that we exhibit the character of God. And that's what the world needs to see in Christians in general, right? The world needs to see Christianity in the way that God intended it to be, as it is in the book. So the only way we get this isn't based on our denominational thinking or or code of beliefs or whatever, but it's going to the book, allowing him to snip and snip and trim and so forth, so we become, have this heart of Jesus. So we can love everybody all the time. Amen? As God loved the world. So churches, sh- churches should be some of the warmest, friendliest, most lovable places that you find in any city or any place. Amen. On our sign out, out front and so forth, we've had this for years, but we always put happy hours. Rather than service times, we put happy hours. Why do we do that? Because I got saved in a nightclub, and they have happy hours, only they're not happy. You know, you get two for one drinks, price, and so forth, and oh, it's happy hour. Yeah, there's, yeah, just wait a couple hours, and it's a hate hour, all right? Not a good deal. People go home, and you know, the devil's smart. You know, all these commercials on sports and so forth, the booze and so forth, and everybody's having a good time, and then they don't show the guy beating up his girlfriend, a guy slugging his wife, somebody raping somebody else. They don't show those things, someone puking in the gutter. They don't show the things. The police used to thank us for being downtown because all the people that would urinate in businesses, people don't think about that in Brookings, but they do. They just pull up, I've got to go to the bathroom. They urinate in windows and stuff downtown. Happens right here in this town. Devil's smart, he doesn't show that. They're not going to show that in the front page of the Brookings Register. But that's what you get with booze. That's what you get with the ungodliness of the world. And Jesus loves everybody. He loves people. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 3. Christ lives in our heart by faith. So he's in you. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's in you. Christ lives in your heart through faith. He lives in your heart through faith. Amen. The Holy Spirit comes. Faith comes. Grace comes. Love comes. Fruit comes. All of them come because of Jesus Christ. So when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all of a sudden, here comes faith. Amen. Here comes love. Here comes joy. Here comes peace. Here here all these things come by the Holy Spirit, and they're all just a deposit into our lives. So all those things come as we receive Christ as our Savior, but they all must be developed. That's where exercise and pruning comes in. All of them have to be developed. You get all of them as seeds, but now you have to do something to that. When you're born as a child, you have all your muscles in your body. You've got biceps and deltoids and all the different muscles and all those things like that, and yet you have to develop those muscles. So if a child would just simply lay around, the child would never walk in its life. It would never walk because the muscles don't get strong. And as a parent, you know how it is. You've had... Most of you have been around children anyway. You have a little child, and you, and you prop them up by the couch or something, and they're wobbly, you know, and they're st- all that. And then, and then what do you do? You keep coaxing them to walk, even though you know they're probably going to fall, right? Because their muscles aren't developed. But, but yet it's like, you know, it's like, ah, they took two steps! Right. And fell down, and then you do what? You pick them up, let's do it again. Yeah. And we do that with the Lord. The Lord does that with us all the time. He wants you to take steps. He wants you to develop muscles. He wants you to develop faith. He wants you to develop your love. He wants you to develop these things so you can be like him. Romans 12, 3, we were all given a measure of faith. So everybody's got this measure, like like a, a, a simple faith, seed faith, right? Mustard seed faith. But then what are you gonna do with the faith that you've been given? Turn to your neighbor and say, you have faith. 
Faith doesn't come down to a feeling. It comes down to a relationship, your trust. Who do you, you have faith in your chair right now. This chair will hold you up. Huh? Yeah, you, have, you didn't even think about it, but you just came in and sat down the, before the service or whatever. You're sitting now and you think, you're not even thinking, but you have faith that that chair will hold you up. You don't know who made the chair. You don't know how, you didn't look underneath and say, is it braced? Are those, is that steel or is that bamboo? You know, is that going to hold me good? Uh, you have faith in your cell phone. You don't know how it operates. You don't know anything about it. You just go, it's on. And you expect it to work. And through that phone, you can go and talk around the world to people. Or talk on video conferencing. Wow, can you believe that? God gives you a measure of faith in the same way you take faith in the Word. Now, if you don't ever, if you're not ever in the Bible, your faith will always be weak. Let me just say this again. It will always be weak. You will always be weak. You will always be a child. You will never grow up. Never. Unless you get into the Word of God. It's like someone says, well, that's just not true. I'll still grow up. Well, you won't. It's like if you take, a, take any person, you don't feed them, they're not going to grow up. So you can find people, and sadly enough, you find people where there's famines and so forth. You can find children, and I've seen children before, they're five years old and they never walk, and they're just emaciated. It's a very sad thing. So the Word of God, we, we grow faith through His Word, amen. amen, by applying the Word of God to our circumstances, to our lives. That's why we're in the world, so we can, we're in a fallen world, so we're in the world, so we can live in victory in this world and be a light for him. So we get a measure of faith. Everybody gets this. You get a measure of faith, and then you develop that faith. Amen? Second Peter says that we grow in grace. So all these things you get when you get saved, but now we're growing. Grow. We increase. <laughs> we increase. Bible says he gives more grace. So there's always a place when we humble ourselves before God, he gives more grace and more grace and more grace to walk in grace. He wants us to grow, amen? Gives us his faith. He gives us his grace. 1 Thessalonians 3 says we can increase and abound in love. So we can increase in love. You, we all can say we have love. We do have love. But he wants us to increase, the goal, of, the goal of the vine dresser is to get more fruit off of the vine. The Holy Spirit wants to bring more fruit out of our lives, just personal lives, right? So he wants, he wants to use you to impact others. That begins in your home, probably with your spouse, but then your children and grandchildren and so forth. He wants to use us there and then everywhere. The Bible says they went everywhere and preached the gospel, but it begins at home. Begins where you live, begins in your house. Uh, otherwise, you could, I could stand up here and I could talk about all these things, but if I wasn't living it in front of my grandchildren, say, your kids are pretty sharp, well, then it's not going to mean much, is it? This is not going to mean much. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, right, you know, go take a hike, you know. <laughs> That's an old term, by the way. Anyway, you know, it, it's something you have to live in your life comes out in your life, comes out in how you act, how you treat others, how nice you are. So we can increase, and then notice the word, you can abound. These words are all there, therefore, we can do this. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can do this. <laughs> so we're talking about flourishing. Everything God did came from this love. He is love, right? So anything in the gospel, anything in ministry, everything proceeds from love. Everything. Faith works by love. So anything in the gospel, this is, you don't hear it emphasized much, but it should be. This is the key. This is the key in our lives is this love relationship with Jesus and then with people. So we can increase and abound in love. In Ephesians 4 then it says we can actually grow up. And we should grow up, right? We don't want to be children anymore. We don't want to be tossed to and fro by all kinds of winds. I think this and that and so forth. No, no, we don't want to be trickery of man, cunning craftiness. But we speak the truth in love and we grow up in all things in him. We grow up in Jesus. Say grow up. Grow up. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm growing up. I'm growing up. 
We grow up in Jesus Christ. We grow up in this love relationship. As children get older, we give them more responsibility to help at home, do things at home. They have more responsibility in school. We expect more. We expect them to grow up. We expect them to mature. We expect them eventually to make adult decisions. The same thing spiritually. The same thing spiritually. The body of Christ in many ways, especially the United States, is filled with babies screaming and squawking and pooping their pants. They're offended over everything. I don't like this. I'm going over there. I'll do this. And they have no faith. Have very little love. Not grace for anybody else. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that. So you grow in the, th in the things of the Lord, and we grow up to act like mature, spiritual adults. Amen. Amen? That's what we, God expects that of us. He expects that of us. Amen. There's, not, there's not an option here. It's not like, oh, you know, you were just born to be kind of a loser. That's fine. No, he expects, he, why? Because Christ lives in us. If he gives us the Holy Spirit, he's giving himself to us to live in us. Amen. So inside of us is the Holy Spirit. Yes. Believe me, all the time I believe the Lord is saying, hey, trust me for this. Hey, here's a word for this. Here's a promise. You can stand on this. Amen. So he's always working in us for his glory. Not for our glory, it's his glory. Because what does he want to do? He wants to reach the world. Why are we here in the first place? To reach the world. It is not, the purpose right now in life is not to make money, to not have lots of things. That's not the purpose. Nothing wrong with that. But the purpose is to serve Jesus. The purpose is the world is going to hell. It's the last days. Maybe I should say that a little bit more. The Lord spoke to me this week, and it's the last days. I had a vision in the night. It's the last days. Oh, wow, the Lord spoke to him. I'm always amazed at people. They read something. God spoke to them. They got a prophetic word. And I'm thinking, woohoo, coo coo. Hello, here we go. Yes, it's the last days. Can we settle that? And once we settle that, then we realize my time is short. Now, my time is short anyway because I'm older, right? The older you get, you know, you're more to the front of the line anyway to go to meet the Lord, all right? You just are. Hello? You realize your mortality. If Jesus doesn't come back, you're leaving the planet. What are you going to leave? The, the issue is leave something that's really important to your family or kids or coworkers or whatever, and that is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what's most important important. Amen? So, so we, have, we have this relationship that we're growing up. In the meantime, we can be used as we're growing up because we're never done done until we go to heaven. So let's go back to Ephesians 3 a second. Ephesians 3, the Amplified there, verse 17 and 19. Through Christ, your faith, uh, through faith, we actually dwell. He do, actually dwells in our hearts you may, may you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. So here, King James says, say, rooted and grounded. So we put down these roots. We're surrounded. We have this security blanket. And what is it in? It's in him. Amen. And it's called love. Right? We're rooted deep in love, founded securely in love, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp all, with all the saints. Uh, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and so forth of the Lord. So we have this place where we're rooted and we're grounded in love. And notice what it says. Uh, let's go to the next verse, verse 19, I think it says, uh, that you may really come to know through experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge. Now, it's, you can have knowledge, but knowledge without experience isn't very good. Yeah, kind of poor. Religious people have lots of knowledge. There's a lot of people, I call them armchair quarterbacks. They're saying what you should do and this and that, but they've never done it. 
I've said many times, it's different like last time watching this game and so forth, but I've been on courts like that. And I've been in front of a lot of people and so forth. And you, then you have people say, you should have did this. You should have done throwing that pass this way. And the armchair quarterbacks, I always say this. This is, how you, this is how you cure an armchair quarterback is you take the person out of the stands from row 20 and say, come on down here. You come on down, throw a helmet on, throw some pads on them, and put them in there the next play. And you're going to run that play on the field. And you're going to hear all the stuff that happens, all the words and the the hitting and so forth, I will guarantee you after one play, that person will come off the field like, here's your helmet. I'm sorry I ever said a word. I'll keep my mouth shut from here on. Because knowledge without experience is not good. We have too much of that in the body of Christ. I think this and I think that. This is my opinion. No, 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 no. What's experience say? You get into experience the love of Jesus Christ, and then you've got something. You realize, hey, Oh, I've been in their shoes. That's not an easy place to be in. Makes you pray for people. Makes you stand with people. Makes you realize, hey, I'm going to stand with you. That's not an easy place. Difficult place. Hard times or whatever. So, so, so the love of Christ surpasses mere knowledge. All right? So he comes to a place where he wants to experience it. He wants us to experience this relationship. Amen? So we can be filled. Say Filled. Notice what it says, all the fullness of God. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I feel so small. John F. Kennedy said, he had a quote, I always liked it, of a, looked at a little sail ship, he liked sailing and so forth. He was the president of the United States in the 60s. A thing, a little thing, his quote was, oh Lord, my, your ocean is so big and my boat is so small. And you could, you could be on it and think, wow, that was a, 35-foot little yacht thing and so forth. That's pretty nice. Get in the ocean. It's a speck. We can be filled with all the fullness of God. The richest measure of the divine presence become body, body holy, filled and flooded with God himself. And I think, oh, Jesus. Amen. Just close your eyes for a minute. Just lift your hands here. Say, Lord, Lord, this word, wow. Lord, we take it. We, we say yes to it that we would be filled with you. The fullness of, fullness of your love, the fullness of your character, the fullness of your grace. Lord, thank you for that. You said it, we believe it. Lord, we receive it. We, we exercise faith muscles even today that we would walk in your shoes by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So we're experiencing the love of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 13 says, that's the greatest. Why? Because it's God. People, people kind of sometimes trivialize and went, let's talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We've got faith to move mountains. I believe that. All comes back to love. Everything. That's why the first part of 1 Corinthians 13, you can have all those things. Don't have love? Pfft, nothing. Nothing. A lot of people, again, they want to they build ministries when Jesus wants to build people. <laughs> he wants to build people. That's what we're trying to do here at the Tabernacle. Even those of you live streaming, and some of you come from other countries, and you're in difficult situations, but we bless you in the name of Jesus. We're always so glad you tune in. Many nations will tune in here to the Tabernacle, but we bless you in the name of Jesus. The God that we're talking about is the same God in the Bible that's in your Bible. And he's not a respecter of persons. He loves every one of us the same. He loves you. He's there for you. Even right, could be your nighttime right now in India right now. It's it's uh, uh, 10, 30 or so, a quarter to 11 at night. But we just speak blessings over you in Jesus' name. God is for us, amen. amen. When you go other places, you, you can't, you have to realize this is not an American gospel. The Bible is not, is not, wasn't written by white people for white people. The Bible is a multicultural book. And we have to understand that. We can't make it American. Can't bend it to our culture, to any culture. It has to be read in the way it is in the New Testament. Amen? Amen. So, so the greatest of these is love. Amen? Amen. There's, life, there's life in the blood, but there's life in the love. Amen. Write it down. There's life in the love. Life in the love. There's life in the love of God. There's life in the love of Jesus. And all the fruit, all the fruit is going to grow out of this Love out of the Holy Spirit, out of Jesus, out of the Father. All the fruit grows out of this love. It's mentioned first when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. 
And the seed, as it says in Genesis, the seed is always in the fruit. So as the fruit grows and matures, what happens is you're sowing more love, seeds, planting, and other people's lives. Becomes generous. You never know, you never know how God may use somebody, you know, by just, by just planting love. There's a guy, I just saw, just saw it this last week again. He's 72 years old. His name is Bill Wilson. And Bill Wilson, <clears throat> we met in 19, let's see, what was it? 79, I think. And Paul and I took Bill Wilson. He was at a church in town here. And this is a young guy. He had children's ministry and so forth like that. And Bill Wilson, just, he was just radical. He was so radical, a lot of people, oh, wow, well, he's kind of radical, you know, kind of didn't know what to think. But anyway, he needed a ride to Jamestown. So Paul and I drove him up to Jamestown, talked the whole time. And, and so at that time, he was at a church in Iowa, and he said, I'm going to New York. I said, what are you going to do in New York? I'm going to the streets of New York for all those kids that need, that don't have dads and so forth, and reach these kids. You know, we're driving the car, mm, that sounds good, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, big dream, big dream, you know, is this going to happen? Bill Wilson goes to New York, and Bill gets on the streets of New York, and he starts feeding people and so forth. And before you know it, he's got a church of thousands and thousands of children that they pick up, that they go to crack houses and so forth, and they pick up kids, and they feed them, and they pray over them. These kids are getting saved by huge amounts. Bill is the guy who's been, boom, he's been shot, he's been stabbed, he's been bricked in the head, recovers, keeps recovering, and keeps going back. And then this week, I get this article, <laughs> Bill Wilson. I thought, I didn't even know Bill Wilson was still alive. He's 72 years old. Where's, where's Bill Wilson today? Well, he couldn't resist himself, so he's in re- Ukraine helping children, wouldn't you know it? Ministering to children in U- Ukraine. This guy, I mean, I mean, he looks old, maybe older, he's older than me, and he's just going a heartbeat until his last heartbeat to do the work of Jesus, to love people. Never concerned about, what's that? The call is the call. It says the need is the call. There's a need. I'm going to go and do it. Never concerned about money. Never concerned about things. Never concerned about building his ministry. All about Jesus. I mean, so we take this fruit, and what, is, what has he done? He's just spilled fruit all over the world. Amen? Fruit matures. You keep giving it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, give it out. Yeah. Got to give it out. So fruit is developed through the word. Fruit is developed through the word when it's applied to the experiences in our life. So we all have experiences. But the fruit is developed through the word. People get that mixed up. Well, they had these bad experiences and so that. God, God did all that so I could get him over here. No, no. Fruit's developed through the word as we apply them to experiences in our life. When people say the other, I said, I can point out, Ten, 100 to 1 people that are bitter and angry toward God because of some experience that someone, that someone said, God did that to you. It's like the lady was selling stuff with pocket calendars and so forth, and a couple years ago, and she's on the phone, and her husband was dying of pancreatic cancer, and she was a believer and so forth. I prayed with her on the phone, and six months later, I talked to her again. Her husband had died. I said, I'm sorry. I said, it's, you know, it's, he's in heaven. She was glad. He was rejoicing in heaven. I said, how's your family? She had two boys. I said, how's your family? Oh, they're not doing so good. Oh, I said, what, what's going on? I said, lady, I've never met and so forth. Atlanta, Georgia, never met this person. But we're talking on the phone. I said, what's, what's wrong? He said, well, we went to the funeral. You know, evangelicals went to the funeral, and the pastor said, and God had a reason for your daddy to die now and use this pancreas and all that stuff. And those kids said, I'm never going back to church again in my life. I said to that lady, I've heard that more times than I can count. You know, boom, the devil says, we got another one. Let's give God a black eye for what he did, which he didn't do. Because people aren't in the word. Because people don't read the Bible. People don't realize we have, there's an adversary called the devil. That we live in a fallen world. I said to her, I said, I'm sorry. I asked God her son's name. I said, I'll pray for your son. I said, I want you to tell him. There's a guy you never in South Dakota praying for you. But I said, I want you to tell him that God is good. He didn't do this. He didn't do this. His fingerprints are not. Let's check the fingerprints at the crime scene. Ah, they're the devils. Okay. 
Second, uh, a couple more verses. Second Corinthians 13 just says, finally, brethren, be complete. So be mature. Yeah. What, what do we also say? We grow up, right? So we grow, we grow up. And we're all in this, pro- all of us, all of us. I realize in a huge way how I'm growing up. We're growing up. We be of good comfort. We encourage one another. Be of one mind. That's the mind of Jesus Christ. How can, the only way you can be in one mind is to read the same thing. You can't be in one mind. You can't be in unity unless, unless you're looking at the same thing, right? Focal point. You're looking at me if it was a focal point because you're focusing. So we have to focal. If we're going to be, look at one thing, Jesus, we have to focus on his word. Live in peace. And notice what it says, the God of love and peace will be with you. So out of this love comes this peace. Peace flows out of that. Amen? Peace flows out of that. Jude 2 says that, that uh, love and peace can be multiplied to you. I say amen to that. Amen. I'm believing for multiplication of love, but the, but the reciprocal thing comes into this area of peace then. Talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Everything proceeding from this love relationship. So peace is multiplied. Now, why is this important? Because, you know, we might think, well, right now, hey, everything's fine and so forth. But the world is changing. The world is changing Wow. Can you believe how much has changed in the last few years? Wow. Not for good. So all the more we have to have love and peace multiplied to us through Jesus Christ, right? It's got to be multiplied. I need more love. I need more peace. So you can sleep at night. You don't have to take a sedative. You don't have to worry. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't have to worry. John 14, 27. So Jesus said, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give. So the peace, it's my peace. So this is proceeding out of love. Peace is coming out of love to us. And it's not like the world gives us. So the world has peace based on all these other political agreements or so forth, or how much money you have in the bank. No, this has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the relationship with love. God of love who loves me, and it loves me enough, I realize, wait, he gives me this peace then. Don't allow your heart to be troubled. Don't allow it to be afraid. Nah, I resist. I resist worry. I resist fear. <laughs> Amen in Jesus' name. So Jesus then in chapter 16, verse 33, when he's talking about overcoming the world, that, that uh, he says you can have peace through this love relationship. You, even though even all these things are going on, but you can overcome this. You can overcome this because of my love. Romans chapter 8 says, Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. So I'm, I'm purposing. Now, have I been fearful and worried? Oh, yes, I've worn all those garments. <laughs> but I purpose to try to do what? To live in this peace. So, so when I'm, when I'm uh, worrying or so forth, and I get in the word and so forth, and the Lord says, you don't have to snip. You don't have to worry about that, Dave. <laughs> and it keeps pruning, and it keeps, I keep growing, and I keep learning. Yeah. You know how it is. People say, we've been in meetings for, like, like someone comes up and they have cancer. and say, oh, we've got to get everybody in agreement here. Everybody, they've, got, they've got cancer. We've got everybody in agreement. Folks, cancer isn't any, big, any bigger than a pimple in God's eyes. It's a word. It's a word. People make it a sentence. People make it a death sentence. Cancer is a word. It's a word. So we don't need to get worked up. Oh, this is a big thing. No, we just keep exercising our faith muscles. And David says, I took care of a lion. I took care of a bear. And this big old guy here is just like them. Not any different. I have a covenant. I know who I believe. I'm standing on the promises. It's going to be all right. And he went and faced Goliath because of his faith and trust in God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got all that you need. <laughs> you, got, you got all that you need. So Philippians 4 says this peace can flourish in us. It passes all understanding. It's, oh, Lord, peace. Why? Because we, we have an experience now. So you can't, it's not like you can understand this. It's not like you can give, I'm going to give five points, and this is what you do, and then you'll have it. It's done. No, it's this relationship, peace coming out of love. So we're praying with thanksgiving, we're making a request known, but this peace of God, this rest, this like, ah, it's going to be all right. 
Well, in the meantime, it might be a terrible storm out there, but it's going to be all right. It'll surpass my understanding. It'll help guard my heart and my mind so I keep all those other things out there, shield of faith, quenching the fiery darts of the wicked one so I can just stand in that peace. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Last thing, first, or 2 Peter 1. And it just says that grace and peace can be multiplied to you. How is it multiplied? How do I get more grace? How do I get more peace? Through the word, through the knowledge of God. That's how I'm going to get it. This isn't a secret. It's not gifted to one group or one denomination or anything. It's, it's this right there for everybody to go and grasp it. So grace and peace is multiplied. So the, ru- the word prunes away worries and fears. So the more grace and peace I get, clip, clip, clip. See, I, I want to, knowing that God is good, you want to get together with him. So you look at the word and say, all right, Lord, thank you. I'm not going to believe that way anymore. And you allow him to work in your life to be pruned, to produce more fruit the way he wants you to do it. Amen? Amen. I was in the hospital last week, a person that had, uh, a young person that had a heart attack at 19 years old, and I walked into the, these ventilated and so forth, walked in intensive care, tubes and so forth, all, this, all those things again, and there was one little place in his hand, or in his arm that was skin, and I reached over and put my hand there as I moved around all the other apparatus and stuff again. And the boy's recovering. Amen. And the boy's off the ventilator. But if you look at all the things in the natural, beep, beep, all the other stuff, you'd have no faith. You don't look at that. You look at Jesus. And when we have Jesus, grace and peace can be multiplied through the word of God that we know and just say, God's bigger than this. God's greater than this. Recovery is happening even now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got it. This isn't, this isn't something said, God, oh, like Old Testament, I'll give this to two or three people. No, he gives it to all his believers. Say it again. Say, I've got it. All of us through Christ Jesus have all these things accessible to us. And they're growing in us. Amen. We're growing. We're growing. Say, we're growing. <laughs> So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for faith. We thank you that you're with us today. We thank you you're moving by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, in spite of what we see, prayers are being answered right now in the name of Jesus. Good things are happening right now in the name of Jesus. I speak blessings over these families, uh, relationships, and children and grandchildren. In the name of Jesus, I believe even now those seeds, Lord, the seeds that have been planted, we pray that we water them. Even now that they would burst forth in truth. Even now we pray that people would come to themselves. Come to themselves, Jesus, and look up to you, Lord God. We pray for good changes, godly changes. We pray for revival in our community, our schools, university, Lord, all around us, our state, our nation, in the name of Jesus, this world. We thank you for revival. We thank you for believers taking up, Lord, your word, Lord, standing on your word and experiencing your word and the power of your great love. Hallelujah. We give you praise today. Hallelujah. Come on, give him some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you deserve glory, Lord. You deserve glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Ah, bless you, Jesus. Yes, 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 Lord. You can share this. You can pass it on to somebody else. You can bless somebody else. And you always want to be doing that, by the way. Amen. Bless people. Take their hand, bless them in Jesus. We saw a guy last night at the elevator, bas- pro basketball player. We are getting on this elevator. We just started. We were just coming from a team late, late at night. And he's in the elevator. We said, what are you doing? He said, well, I pray. He pl- he's a player with the Timberwolves. He happened to be there. And, it, and so we started talking and, with one of their leagues and stuff. And so we said, well, can we just speak a blessing over you? And he says, sure. He played at North Carolina. So we're standing there. Standing there in the hallway, we laid hands on him, we blessed him. He said, thank you so much, you know. Opportunities, amen. All right, bless your neighbor, bless your neighbor, amen.